Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Robe. I'm the Marketing Events Manager here at Flyleaf. Thank you so much for coming to hear Chris Armitage read from his new book, um, Unlocking My Word Hoard. He's going to be joined by Bland Simpson and we'll be reading selections from the book. Um, thanks for purchasing your book from Flyleaf. Um, your support means that we can put on programs such as this in the community, so thank you so much. Um, and I want you to remember that we close at seven tonight so um, when Professor Armitage wraps up the program, if you want to keep speaking with your friends, it's a lovely night, so I can recommend outside when the seller's patio is open, but my colleagues will be trying to shut down the tills up front at seven, so thank you. Um, and so now I would like for um, Professor Armitage's publisher to speak to a few words about um, Grateful Steps, the organization that publishes um, his book and others, so um, take it away. Thank you. Well, I loved working with Dr. Armitage. It was all done by phone. And it was 12 o'clock every Thursday for as many weeks as it took to get the book done. The best part about it was that we just we would get each other laughing. And since you, a lot of you folks know him, you can appreciate how easy that would be to do with this gentleman. And um, we have um, a unique publishing company. We, have, we are um, traditional like the big guys, meaning that nobody goes out and pays money and to get their book published. Uh-huh, they're picked. And um, of course our way of picking them is inviting them in. And we're a nonprofit. That doesn't mean our folks can't make a profit. It means that um, we are doing a community service. Now how's that work for a publishing company? because a large proportion of our authors have had very troubled lives and are, are um, writing about it. And in the course of the way we work, one-on-one, -on -one, transformation takes place. And I'm sure depending on what kind of work you're in, you can understand that happening. And there are amazing stories that transformation take place while people work on their mentors, on their memoirs. And um, we also, our full genre, we'll do poetry and photography and fiction, nonfiction, science fiction. And um, we don't limit our authors to those who are down and out and have a story that um, needs to be fixed. And that's why how somebody like Dr. Armitage comes along. We're so happy that Paul Taylor, one of his students here at Chapel Hill, now a lawyer in Asheville, um, referred him to, to our uh, company so that we could enjoy this very unique book. We have a lot of poetry books, but this one's different. And you'll hear more about how it is when um, Lance Simpson, who's also in the book, um, talks about um, uh, working together with him. The um, combination of his knowledge about um, poetry from years and years and years back and famous poets put together with his unique modern poetry makes you want to just go out and read and learn more and um, that's a book that will cause you to do it. So I appreciate us having this event tonight. Thank you. All right, so now um, I'd like to say that Professor Armitage would really like it if all of the guests here tonight would sign so he knows who came by because that was one bone of contention after his retirement party was that he couldn't keep track of everyone that was there and he was very upset. Including that he... a very expensive bottle of scotch. <laughs> so, <laughs> please I don't sign... know who it was. That and the other presents I have not acknowledged. So I'm known as an ingrate all over the continent. So if you would please, so please sign, sign. Um, your name on this list before you leave. I'm going to leave it on the table so he knows who is here and can, can remember this evening. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce our moderator, conversation partner, Bland Simpson, um, who will be in this evening conversation with Professor Armitage. Bland Simpson is the keen and distinguished professor of English and creative writing at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the author of many best-selling books. He's also a pianist for the Red Clay Ramblers, the Tony Award-winning string band. In 2005, he received the North Carolina Award, the state's highest civilian honor. So 
Thank you, Glenn. If you'd like to Thank come up, and now he's going to introduce and continue our evening. Thank Chris for um, asking me to be part of this. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We're here to celebrate my longtime friend and colleague, Christopher Armitage, a 53 year member of our UNC Chapel Hill faculty and recipient, among many other honors, of the UNC System Board of Governors Teaching Award for Excellence, the highest honor uh, in our entire university system. I want to take just a moment to salute his signal accomplishments with and influence on the development of study abroad at UNC, which at the time he began his very popular summer academic trips to the UK, study abroad here was limited to the Toronto Exchange, a 10-day trip to Toronto for a dozen or so UNC students, and a similar visit to Chapel Hill by a handful of Canadians, if Canadians may be measured in such a way. <laughs> Nowadays, study abroad for a term or two is a matter of course for UNC students. And we've long been a national leader in that. Chris Armitage's imagination and leadership helped make that so. In his Shakespeare Through Performance Honors class, students would spend about three weeks in London with classes at UNC's honors programs, Winston House, say amen, Jim LaLute is the director of that program. <laughs> and three weeks at St. Edmund Hall, Chris's alma mater the last surviving medieval hall at Oxford and the oldest academic society for the teaching of undergraduates. One of my playwriting students who went on the UK trip told me that during the performance of a Harold Pinter play in London, he had sat next to Professor Armitage, who said bemusedly during the various pauses, <laughs> oh, that is so Pinter. <laughs> that is so Pinter. <laughs> In unlocking my word hoard, the eminent Renaissance scholar and Chris Armitage cast his shrewd yet empathetic eye on life, on death, across the ages. From his bomb shelter moments as a boy during World War II's Battle of Britain to his delivering the ghost's line from Hamlet upon the fog-shrouded parapets of Kronborg Castle in Denmark, while being filmed by tourists from Japan. Armitage's poems and his taught, moving memoir are by turns witty, trenchant, sagacious, and thoroughly delightful. This is a true tour de force. My great friend, fellow thespian, Chris Armitage. Thank you for those kind words, Mr. North Carolina. Um, I'm trying to resist uh, commenting on the plays of uh, Harold Pinter, <laughs> so uh, I will succeed in doing that. Um, I'm, I'm glad that there's such a splendid turnout tonight. I was told recently that uh, a prominent political uh, figure was in uh, Durham this weekend and um, I wondered how I could possibly compete, um, but I see your better judgments have prevailed. <laughs> uh, uh, it's not that I avoid the subject of politics, far from it. Um, I didn't want to write a memoir about how I got from grade six to grade seven and the day a little girl kicked me in the shin and I cried and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was well aware there is a world outside, as a famous Shakespearean figure uh, remarks when exiled by his fellow Romans. Um, and um, the microcosm uh, can only exist within or abutting the macrocosm. And I'm very con pleased to have been able, although obviously I'm reflecting my highly personal views about a lot of things, including Mr. Putin, um, that um, I'm able to relate uh, my own uh, uh, trivial existence um, to uh, that of the great globe itself. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the back history of how I came to write some of these poems and uh, the <coughs> technical devices uh, that I apply. And in fact, 
the book is also a kind of um, way of progressing through most of the main phases, uh, phases of English literature over the last several centuries, uh, as I will show you as we go along, because I adopt different writing styles of different centuries uh, right up to the uh, modern time. I'm going to begin with unexpected logic um, with page one. Um, so uh, if you, uh, let me see, am I, am I to hit something? No, I'm doing it. You're doing it. Like, there it uh, do we have a text here? Besides, most of you, very generously, have got your own text. You can write your own footnotes uh, in, or nonsense in the margin or whatever it is you feel like gonna, writing. My clicker isn't working, so I'm going to sit up here. Okay. 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 So on page one um, of the actual texts, uh, uh, the, there is a chunk of prose. It's excellent prose, an English translation of excellent Latin um, by the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede was uh, one of the chief promoters of Christianity in early medieval England, and they were constantly being harassed in every sense of the word from not only having the monasteries knocked down, um, the manuscripts destroyed, uh, raped and killed, but managed uh, to keep going. And uh, uh, if Christianity is still visible in England, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, that's the Venerable Bede's uh, background. And so the prose, I'm not going to take the time to read because I know my vigilant uh, watchdog here uh, will kick us out at seven. So you can read the prose on your own leisure because that's the way to read prose, which is one reason why I write poetry. Because as I explain in several places, including the introduction, um, I have certain principles that I attempt to follow, one of which is conciseness. Now, you'll hardly believe this the way I'm rattling on at the moment, and even more so if you know me in conversation, but actually in writing I'm really quite severe on myself. So I want you to look at this particular poem, and actually while I'm talking about the different areas of the book, uh, and the divisions are signified by titles in the pages of con a page of contents, um, that uh, the, uh, the whole book is shaped. Because actually what I am uh, alluding to, uh, as a fairly safe verb, I think, for the first poem, is which is about uh, human existence on this planet and whether anything exists uh, afterwards. I'm in the process of writing an essay about the misuse of the word passes. I know you don't want to use a four letter word. No, not that one. The other one, D-E-A-D. -E I mean, I realize that's a very threatening word. We'd better get used to it because all of us are facing it. May I remind you? Um, and um, that uh, um, the issue of, is there another life? I'm sure we have a variety of religious positions sitting in this room, from what I know of some of you. Um, and I actually close on the very same theme, the epilogue, after all my uh, uh, prose passages, um, which some people prefer to my poems, which pleases me very much because uh, that famous American patriot, Ezra Pound, <coughs> Those of you who know anything about Ezra will say Patriot is rather a stretch, <laughs> especially when the GIs got hold of him in 1944. Uh, but anyway, Ezra Pound remarked that prose should be as well written as poetry, a fact which makes me very unpopular when I broach it to my students. Now, of course, I have no students. I just sulk at home, Armitage in the Hermitage, um, and watch my formerly fairly cultivated uh, garden in the days uh, where, when ladies were willing to marry me and look after the garden. They seem to, uh, there seem to be no more of those. Um, but uh, 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 this was part of my recreational activity, a little gardening. Now it's merely preventing the creepers reaching my porch and invading my uh, very house. 
Um, so uh, that is my alternate uh, uh, activity when not scribbling. So uh, if you would look at the text here of uh, dis uh, discussing life after death, the universal theme for all of us, hence the two pillars shaping the beginning and end of this book, um, it will uh, have the vigilant amongst you will have noticed that it's laid out in a certain form. When you look at the lines, you will observe they each get shorter. That is intentional because I'm trying to re borrow from other arts, including uh, uh, painting in some cases, visual effects. And the whole idea that a poem might have a visual shape in addition to whatever its words meant was very, very popular in the 17th century. Somebody like George Herbert wrote several shaped poems like the altarpiece and uh, Easter wings and other such poems in which the very layout of the type is like a picture of what the words in the poem are discussing. Well, in this case, the lines get shorter because ones remaining, life gets shorter. And so we move uh, uh, through this um, summing up the essence of what the narrative describes below it. The narrative offers all the embellishments of who was there, what were they doing, what was the atmosphere, and all this stuff which novelists use to keep us uh, half awake uh, when they're engaged in their craft. So I want to concentrate, as I stressed several times in the introduction and elsewhere, the essence of a subject, whether it's falling in love or the German invasion of Soviet Russia. Um, and so here you have each line getting shorter in the poem and the visual effect reflects the theme of the poem and of the prose written in a perfectly different style for a different effect uh, are, is the same message. Um, so advancing rapidly to page two, um, yes, I spent a lot of time working on Sir Walter Raleigh, and um, uh, uh, he is actually dealing with the same matter, but with a rather different perspective, since his life was always threatened with all being almost immediately stopped by a vengeful King James or Spaniards or anybody else he crossed in his adventurous uh, life. Um, that uh, he still comes to the same verdict of uh, what are we doing here in our brief sojourn. Um, and um, I think that was a speak for itself. Um, uh, but uh, you'll notice there that there is a more uh, religious upbeat at the end of the poem. But however much uh, our bodies decay, that is not what happens to the spirit according to some religions. And uh, uh, continuing, the next poem deals with um, uh, in triplets um, with uh, the uh, collapse of the Habsburg Empire, as uh, spelled with a B, not a P, as various uh, German professors have uh, taught me. And the pictorial device at the bottom uh, brings the, the issue very clearly into effect. Uh, you have uh, uh, the two houses that were blended together to form the Austro-Hungarian Empire represented visually and colorfully and I'm indebted uh, to uh, my ever diligent uh, um, editor and publisher Mickey whom you've already met for digging this item out. Um, elemental destructiveness of course deals with the theory of the four elements and how in modern warfare we manage to pervert each of them differently. Um, and uh, I think that poem is pretty uh, straightforward. With that immortal quotation by Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Ma uh, Minister, and uh, notice please, uh, the, uh, this poem is a great opportunity for frequent misquotation. It is not the lights are going out all over Europe, but the lamps are going out because we were still in the day of that ballad, The Old Lamplighter, 
who goes around with a long stick uh, lighting all the different uh, lamps, uh, which now, if we're lucky, get lit by electricity um, and so forth. So uh, the pervasive effect of modern warfare in destroying all the elements which constitute uh, our existence is what I'm, uh, I had in mind in that poem. The next poem is one of the few personal poems in the book. Um, uh, it involves, of course, as the picture shows me and one of my twin sisters. I had twin sisters, both of whom died in childhood of different causes. The other one, Judy, I have very little visual recollection of whatsoever because she spent much of her brief life in hospital. Bessie, who is patting me on the head, which is not what every, every uh, one of my relatives does, is um, visible in the picture and my aunt Kathleen in the background um, and um, uh, uh, there are some notes elaborating on this uh, uh, moment of the the false peace of the 1930s uh, when of course uh, uh, Neville Chamberlain was unable to recognize that when he was negotiating with Adolf Hitler about seizing another piece of Europe he was not dealing with a gentleman of the old school, but with an, uh, an unscrupulous and fast-moving operator. And so, uh, Ch poor Chamberlain comes back with a piece of paper. It is peace for our time, while uh, the German forces are mass massing, ready to take over another chunk of Czechoslovakia, because it's full of German-speaking people. This, of course, is an aftermath of the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire when all the many nationalities who made that uh, construct up were now separate countries speaking separate languages. Um, and uh, so in the background uh, uh, to this poem uh, too, um, uh, Hitler of course who, who assured Chamberlain I have no further territorial ambitions when he soon knights the rest of Czechoslovakia, not German-speaking residents in the country, and then set his eyes on Poland. And I shall remember as possibly one of the most vivid days in my life. The Sunday morning, I came downstairs and my parents were listening to the radio, which was rather unusual because in those days, we didn't have radios on day and night in uh, domestic houses, even in England. And uh, what we were hearing was Mr. Chamberlain telling us that uh, since uh, the German forces moved into Poland on September the 1st and had been sent an ultimatum that they were to be out by September the 3rd and Mr. Chamberlain almost tearfully said and having received no reply uh, from the Führer this country is now at war with Germany. Now, I was eight years old at that time, but I nevertheless recognized in the tone of uh, uh, my parents' voices and my father uh, served in the last few months of uh, World War I in the trenches, then in the German army, of, uh, the British army of occupation on the Rhine. And the only thing I ever heard him say about his time in Germany, I liked the German people which made a big effect on me because I was hearing different things from the study of uh, history. So anyway, that, as I say, is unusual, unusually per personal, but for very good reasons related to the macrobasm of what was happening in Europe at that time. Um, and then, of course, I, I borrow from Picasso, and somehow or other my ever-diligent editor, publisher, got a copy of Picasso's famous picture, which you have reproduced at no extra charge uh, on uh, whatever page it is. Uh, page, uh, I can hardly see, I better put my glasses on um, to get the page number right. Uh, you, you, most of you have your own copies, so uh, uh, you're able to follow without uh, needing the excellent use of the screen. Yes, um, yes. Okay, I'll leave that. And the next one, of course, I've just been talking about uh, the craftiness uh, and deviousness of uh, 
the Gestapo and the Nazi secret service was to get out of concentration camps a few wretches who were more or less still alive, kill them, put them in Polish uniforms as if they had actually come from Poland and use this as an excuse to say Poland had violated uh, the, the sacred territory of the Third Reich and therefore Germany was now attacking Poland. Another piece of uh, propaganda. Um, it's interesting that the only PhD amongst the Nazi hierarchy, um, uh, Joseph Goebbels, um, uh, had perverted his um, ability with words. Um, um, uh, the astounding thing late in the war, you sometimes see on newscasts, the extraordinary, uh, already it was clear that the Russians were going to pound the Germans into the earth and were already advancing on Germany. And there is Goebbels demonstrating oratory perverted to its most destructive use saying, what do you want? Total war. And the whole, by the time he's finished, the whole German crowd are roaring for total war, which they were about to get, though they didn't know it, as the Russians advanced into Germany and took a terrible revenge for the atrocities that had been committed when the Germans, first of all, seized the Ukraine one of the, to me, one of the tragedies of the war is that you, the Ukrainians who had been suffering under the tyranny of Stalin throughout the 1930s now were greeting the German invaders with enthusiasm and then found out that Hitler was worse than Stalin. Um, but uh, we learn these lessons from history with great difficulty. Um, the whole idea of space travel as a spin-off from uh, conquering the air, whether you're using it just to bomb people uh, down below or not. Um, I've, my poem on Von Braun uh, has met with uh, quite a bit of uh, approval. I've been unable to find from people much more fluent in German than myself whether Von Braun's Nazi metal is it still in Germany, or if it was found in the top drawer of his dresser after his death, or whether he'd wisely shed it before he became a bastion of the United States national defense? Well, if you can use your enemies and convert them to your side, um, that's modern politics. And then, of course, there's George Orwell, um, uh, whose career I sum up um, uh, with the comment, that as, uh, however much 1984 was regarded first of all as a fantasy and then as an alarming discussion of what was already apparent in the modern nation state. But when you consider what happens now uh, with electronic warfare, I've often been wondering that one break which has affected Britain about five or six years ago when uh, the whole electrical system in Britain was severely affected by uh, foreign intrusion electronic. Uh, all the operations that were going on at the time couldn't continue. I mean, medical operations. And I'm wondering how many people died because uh, of an interrupted uh, uh, medical operation. I've never seen any figures on that, but no doubt somebody has uh, compiled them somewhere. Um, but the deterioration and the vision of Orwell, knowing very well that the widespread and calmly acknowledged use of torture nowadays, um, uh, Orwell uh, knew all about it. Uh, and indeed, one of the most stunning parts of 1984, when uh, his male figure is being severely tortured and he reaches the point of the pain being intolerable, says, do it to his girlfriend. The absolute breakdown of any kind of loyalty, the woman he loves, and in order to stop them torturing him, he bursts out with, do it, I've forgotten the name of the lady in question. But the other fallacy, of course, about torturing prisoners is that they will confess to everything after a while, including total fantasy. Uh, for which they still get tortured anyway. 
but the reliability of getting information that's useful from uh, prisoners by torturing them uh, should be looked at much more carefully. The next poem is about myself and two of my colleagues, uh, now both deceased, or past as some people say, um, but more of that when my next book comes out, The Fallacy of Misusing Past. I mean, past what? Past a test? Past a landmark? Past what? You know? More of that in my next production, which you may all sign up for in advance. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm glad you are, y'all chuckle. You notice I'm also <laughs> linguistically quite fluent. <laughs> right. Okay, well, these birds, who were both in tutorials with me and constantly humiliating me by proving that they'd done a lot more work in the week since the last tutorial and outshone me, who had hastily compiled uh, some glib remarks about the subject and uh, therefore had to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous... Uh, uh, peers pretending uh, that they'd never heard such rubbish. In fact, they probably never had such heard such rubbish as I occasionally served up. Uh, and uh, the toleration of the Oxford tutors is absolutely remarkable. Um, the stuff they have to put up with in these weekly papers uh, is just extraordinary. It's almost as bad as being in Greenlaw and having a bunch of student papers given you in green law. I must say, I hate being retired. I love talking about literature, history, and other subjects which I have some garbled views about, obviously. And I miss the stimulus of going into meet a group of well-informed people, well-mannered, they actually smile at you, and you feel that you're doing something useful rather than other things you might be doing with your life. Now, I want you to know what the facing page is. Little did you know it, but I'm connected with the highest branches of American journalism. The proof is right there on page 13. Imagine my astonishment uh, when I'd written to Judy and Gwen. That, by the way, is Gwen Eiffel, the black lady who used to be on the program with Judy, who has died some time ago now, uh, and so on. But at the time, I wrote a letter up complimenting uh, uh, Judy and Gwen on uh, the material they'd been covering. I forget what the topic was, but it was a major topic and the, well, the judicious way they handled it. So I sent off a letter uh, somewhere up into Washington and it apparently reached uh, PBS TV because to my astonishment, Judy Woodruff sent me this written reply. And I have the original, for those of you who doubt my veracity. <laughs> so that was very nice uh, to get uh, that reply, and such a modest one too. Well, now we're getting to a more fun stuff, contemporary politics. And here we have Dick Cheney, your, your favorite person to despise. Um, Dick Cheney told Bush that Sadat had the bomb. Please notice, I can handle a line of iambic pentameter when I try. And I do try, not all the time, um, but it, it rolls off the tongue perfectly. That, of course, is what the younger Bush, the older one having served in World War II, knew a lot more about the world than the second President Bush. And of course, with Dick Cheney advising you, it would be like having Mephistopheles greeting uh, perverting Faustus. I mean, you consider the career of that man. And it's amazing the way these thoroughly corrupt politicians always seem to come back in another form. I don't know how it happens. Uh, but anyway, um, then we get on uh, uh, a poem I'm rather proud of because it falsely persuaded my students that I was connected with rock music. <laughs> now, I want here and now to declare in public that my trinity is Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. Now, I do listen to country music, though I do not believe that Dolly Parton has always loved me. I do not believe that. But I do some of the other singers. Uh, I, I find them quite enchanting, uh, um, especially the doleful ditties of Patsy Cline. Now, there's another thing. I look at Cline, 
I, not literally. I consider Klein that obviously her name should be spelled K-L-E-I-N. And she has a kind of gift of German lyricism because in all those doleful songs she sings, uh, I recognize that you've only to change uh, a, uh, a, a pronoun or two. For instance, in this one, um, uh, yes, um, um, uh, uh, I, let me see, I've lost my place here. That's what happens to me. I get lost in this book. Uh, it's sort of full of distractions. So anyway, I, I'm a great fan of Patsy Cline and that uh, grizzled old fellow who's always uh, uh, singing and not paying the IRS. Uh, um, who am I talking about? Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson. <laughs> Willie Nelson. Yeah. Gosh. Boy. <laughs> he could turn the ballad rather well. It's, it, there's really something of the troubadour about him. Uh, um, and other uh, country music singers, I like them very much. But in spite of my cunning insertion of the words Davy Bowie in the previous poem, that was only to get the students off my back because they now thought Armitage is actually interested in rock music. That is a form I am not interested in, partly because my middle son is a drummer. <laughs> right? So, uh, I think I've said enough to identify <laughs> that subject. Yes. Yes, now, uh, the classical scholar um, becomes a refugee. I had a, well, I did enjoy this poem, because now you know, you hear all of a sudden, I, the word diaspora, I had never heard it in America for my first 80 years here. And all of a sudden, I heard the diaspora this and the diaspora who wouldn't know, wouldn't know a diaspora for an aspirin, um, and so on. So uh, I, I, had, I really enjoyed this uh, uh, card and of course managed to get in a bit of Latin as well at the bottom to demonstrate uh, my, the range of my linguistic uh, disabilities. So uh, I, I did that because, uh, you know, the people who uh, play on compassion Obviously, America has been very good to all kinds of refugee people throughout history. Um, but uh, the, the, false, uh, uh, the false humiliator uh, is a particularly odious form of sub-crook. Not bold enough to be a real crook, but can make insinuating remarks uh, below the surface. Oh, yes. Now, here's the one that's going to get me in trouble with some members of this room. Um, on page 18. Um, yes, I'm linking up Coriolanus, um, uh, the, the, the man who, uh, when he ran for civic office after beating Volsky, the great enemies of Rome, but he said, I will not show you my wounds. And so, of course, the public turned on him and he winds up being driven out of Rome. This is one of Shakespeare's less attended to tragedies, and it's got a great deal of value in it uh, about uh, uh, the allegiance of the man in the street to the public figure. Uh, Coriolanus gets it both ways and winds up, uh, and, oh, he, this should make it very, very popular in America. When he has come back after Rome has kicked him out, after he saved Rome, he comes back at the head of the Volsky army uh, to sack Rome. What stops him? His mother comes out and asks him to stop. It's really an American story. So I, I uh, commend to you uh, Coriolanus. I mean, you all know Hamlet. You don't want me to talk about Hamlet. So that's all right. Um, and this, you notice, is in triplet. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of adding several triplets, but uh, I'll get out of this room alive first and go and write them in private. <laughs> and you can catch up with them in my second book, if and when it ever appears. The Simpsoniad, well, here we are. At last I'm able to pay tribute to my colleague here. <clears throat> now, one of the features of the classical epic is that you establish the forebears and origin and background of uh, the uh, individual you're talking about. He's all, of course, in Greek and Roman, he's always related to the gods, who in any case are all too human themselves. It's very interesting in the, those religions that they had the good sense to make the gods look human. 
right? Uh, because it enabled you to identify them with them more closely. So when they were nasty to one another and had all those quarrels and produced the Trojan War and all the rest of it, it, it somehow was more understandable than that feeble attempt of Satan to tempt Christ in the wilderness. I mean, that was a show. We all knew how that was going to turn out. Um, but uh, at least in the pagan religions, the sense that they were reflecting humanity, the gods were just a, a noisier form of human being, right? So that's, uh, first of all, we have to get our uh, tragic uh, uh, protagonist identified with figures in the gods. And you see that I do in the first quatrain. And then in the second quatrain, you have to identify his accomplishments of your hero of the epic poem. And so the second quatrain does that. And the third quatrain is the celebration of the glory of the epic figure. So it's all there, you see, stage by stage. Um, you thought I just tossed these things off when I was drunk. You're wrong. <laughs> so there we are. There, you see, blandly, in all three stages of the requirements for the epic hero. Uh, yeah, fine. Um, carpe diem, uh, this is a feeling of my own reflections. If, if I had an award for all the goals I'd scored after the final whistle had been blown, Manchester United would be signing me up. By the way, I was born about two miles away from Manchester United's crowd. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, when I got to Oxford and could stop playing rugger, because every secondary school I was at played rugby. And by the way, I hope you notice that in the poem near where the big full page picture is, I talk about rugby football and I explain the rules of rugby to you at no extra charge, right? So all you ever wanted to know, and after all American football is, I'm sorry to tell you, based on it, except of course Americans have improved on it by having people wear helmets and lots of padding and ruin their brains and so on. Rugby players do get hurt too, but not in the way American football players get hurt. Okay, uh, so there we are. Uh, we've about, we've about 20 minutes left, by the way. Oh goodness, we're only up to page 22. You all wanted to stay longer. <laughs> Demand that the children are okay. uh, Yeah, I, I usually don't stop for less than two hours. So, uh, okay, uh, sanitizing the British Museum. This is straightforward. Now this contemporary stuff. Uh, you all know what we're about. Rough stuff in Syria, page 23. Um, and that, uh, there's a new flare-up in uh, about Syria the whole business with Syria, right? It's back in the news at the moment because Mr. Putin, not sufficiently occupied in the Ukraine, has now decided to turn up the heat in Syria, which has been suffering under that appalling Assad. And I have to confess to you that Assad was educated in London as a dentist, <laughs> right? So now you know he was an he was an incipient sadist from the beginning, right? <laughs> so he goes back home where he's got all those people he can be sadistic to. He's a dentist. That's that's my explanation of uh, him. The government has not inquired. They, uh, I don't know why they don't keep sending for me for one of these think tanks. I mean, Judy Woodruff writes to me. And I'm predicting that very point. I predict the Taliban is sneaking back. Why have I not been summoned to a think tank? <laughs> right. You should ask that question. And the same thing, here we are in Saudi Arabia. Oh, heavens of Lord. You lucky women. You can now drive a car. It's followed by six cars driven by men, of course. And so on. The whole thing there. What well, this... this this book has to be, is going to become a documentary of the times in which we live. Because Armitage is getting at uh, 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 Iraq, uh, Cheney, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the whole bunch of them. And watch what you drink. You know what happened, Paul Navalny. Now look at this for international law. Naval Navalny was flying back across Russia to get some medical treatment in Germany and Putin calmly orders the plane landed and arrests Navalny. 
Now, if we then think, well, maybe we should be a little more satisfied with our leaders. They aren't quite that bad yet, right? Yeah, watch what you drink. Okay, these are all, yes, Kenland, Kenland, I met as a Rhodes Scholar from New Brunswick while I was at Oxford, and he's very absent-minded, he's a wonderful guy. I'm about to go on a, a two-week uh, theatre tour in Ontario with him and his wife. We do this every uh, year. We go to the Stratford, Ontario Shakespearean Festival, which is as good as the one in Stratford, England. And then we leap over to the Niagara Peninsula and do the Shaw Festival. That's Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde and those people. And it's a very, uh, a very refreshing experience. Um, yes, and here, of course, the, uh, I, uh, you can work out Dr. 20, page 27. Uh, my tribute to my late black colleague, Randall Keenan, who was once on the Oxford program with me. I think that's when he christened me the Lion of Greenlaw, uh, but uh, he, he, alas, uh, passed recently, as you're aware in the poem shows. Yeah, the COVID-19 plague. Um, yes, um, well, here I am, you know, this is Armitage once again, uh, death obsessed, uh, um, and thinking of the next uh, world, uh, etc. Vaccination, well, he, you want a topical poem, Page uh, 30 is for you. Um, page 31 will be incomprehensible to you unless you've uh, done children's books with your kids when they were growing up in Canada. Otherwise, some of the titles there are of children's books. Um, my three sons were all born in Canada. So since I emigrated to Canada, one of the surprising things in my life, the gentleman who writes uh, um, uh, in the uh, introduction about me, uh, the Reverend Ben Witherington, uh, whom I once collaborated with uh, on a book. He's now written at least 30 books, including uh, on the role of women in the New Testament, and so on, a very distinguished scholar. And I, he was foolish enough to ask me to cooperate with him on the book. And so I was to supply texts of poems and discuss them from literature, and he would supply the theological side. and. Uh, Usually he'd got the theological side done before I'd started on the literary side. And he said to me eventually, Chris, it's not really that you're, uh, uh, what's the person who doesn't get things done quickly? Um, a postponer. Um, uh, uh, you know, who is a known postponer who will never get things done on time. What's the word for Procrastinate. Thank you. Pro for before, crass, tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Procrastinator. Thank you. Yeah. No, he said, Chris, you're not a procrastinator. You're a ruminator. He said, I've watched your eyes. And when we start teaching a topic, within 10 seconds, you've probably made your mind up. But it takes 10 weeks for you to tell us what your decision is. You are a ruminator. So uh, I was duly ch chastened by that accurate observation. Um, the next one's about how much longer can I hope to live? I tell you candidly, I was born in 1931, uh, a fact which a, d a recent doctor examining me, this young lady doctor walked into the uh, uh, clinic uh, where I'd been waiting looked at me, turned round and walked out. I'd say, oh my God, my effect on women is getting worse. <laughs> she came back a few minutes later. She said, I've just been back and you really were born in 1931. I said, that is true. So anyway, that's why the two question marks uh, are in the title line there. I don't know how much longer I'm going to last. Now on literary trails, uh, these are all poems I'm going to... <clears throat> Read maybe one of them to you. The first one on page 37, where I take on the role of Polonius. <clears throat> I've done quite a bit of acting, you've never guessed. And um, uh, I enjoy uh, uh, taking on roles, though I enjoy directing more, because then you can bully more people at once. But anyway, um, <clears throat> as you recall, Polonius Hamlet Shakespeare with that infinite genius uh, as uh, Polonius say such things as uh, 
about time and <laughs> how how to use it and how it lasts and uh, verbosity and so on and so here he is my children have reached that dangerous age when burning in the blood mere lust doth rage though i diverted mine to politics that's where i learned the use of dirty tricks revealing is the choice of college while hamlet in wittenberg seeks knowledge laertes to paris yearns to return to whores i fear i have precepts for him and he does later give him a line of precepts including the immortal to thine own self be true, and then thou canst not be false to any man. Question one. To which of yourselves are you true, Polonius? Or where is your true self? How do you find the itself on which you are to model yourself? You know, but it makes good, you know. And it's a wonder. Polonius is a magnificent creation by Shakespeare. And then King Lear. I explained to my male man the other day um, he said he said to me well, are you really a professor <laughs> I said yes he said what do you profess I said well I teach English I did it for 53 years at Chapel Hill and uh, he said well what sort of things do you talk about I said well we talk about the plays of Shakespeare for instance he said what are they about I said well there's this guy King Lear who's settling his will on his three daughters and he's clearly, in 80 plus years, never paid any attention to them individually, what they liked, and so on. And so he makes disastrous choices, which brings doom on nearly everybody in the play. He said, that's amazing. That's just like real life. <laughs> I said, yes. That's why Shakespeare wrote about it, uh, and so on. But we all can't write as well as Shakespeare. Okay, well, on we go. This is easy stuff. I want you to look on page 40, where you see six immaculate quatrains <laughs> identified by speaker and number. The age of reason, the 18th century is before you. The clarity, order, and so forth. And my wonderful editor publisher got all six stanzas on the same page. And I was thinking of writing a seventh and eighth stanza, and I thought it'd be a pity to spoil it. Who cares if the bottom margin is a little bit overrun? <laughs> Nobody cares, right? Oh yeah, the next poem. This poem has cost us more than any poem in the book. The vile commercial people who own that photograph, which actually shows little girl tugging daddy into the zoo and dragging him up to this wonderful a glass of protection from the tiger and I said we can use that and so on and how much did it cost us Mickey finally what did we have to pay for this photo we talked it down to 500 because it was just the amino there you have it yeah now the next few pages you've got to be a literary fan for them because I imitate the style of all the famous Victoria, romantic uh, poets uh, uh, there and gave myself a little extra space for Keats. One, because I love him. Two, because I saw the opportunity to combine Keats's love for Shakespeare with mine. Yeah, well, I've got Wordsworthian moments, a quartet of Keats. Page, now looky here, page 46 and 47. Here's real life for you. The guy in the centre, the tallest one, is the late Townsend Luddington. And I have a story to tell you. A, a few months ago, I was packing to catch a flight to Oklahoma City, where my youngest son and uh, his daughter, my granddaughter, have just produced a great granddaughter for me. I'm baffled by this because I haven't even found out how to be a proper grandfather. Never mind a great grandfather yet. But anyway, um, uh, I was packing to go there and I got this sudden impulse, I don't know whether it was divine or not, <coughs> said, you get over to see Tony. Tony's been ill for quite a while, living at home in Chapel Hill. And I thought, well, I can finish packing. I'm going to spend a month in an Oklahoma City. I'll see him when I get back. Voice said, go to Tony's house now. 
it, it didn't literally say it that loud, of course, but the impulse. So I thought, damn it, I'd better drive over there. So I did, and we had a wonderful 40 minutes, Downey in the middle, and we're laughing about the two young men, now important alumni, of course, who we used to thrash when they were undergraduates, and many others, had a wonderful 45 minutes. I left, got back, finished my packing, flew to Oklahoma City. I'd not been there 48 hours, and I got a phone call. Tony Luddington died last night. Right? These are moments which give you some pause about the existence of uh, extraterrestrial forces influencing our lives. An omen while shaving, well, that's, I uh, get a famous line of Eliot's in there. And Yeats, of course, has to match him on a facing page. Yeats, being an Irishman, was more long-winded. So, yeah, in fact, that poem is actually eight stanzas long, but I didn't feel like writing eight stanzas, though I worship Yeats. Um, and then, of course, uh, here's Clever Armitage on page 50, playing with words. Mixed Blessing. Well, Mixed Blessing has been a very popular poem. In fact, uh, one of my former chairmen, who used to give me a hundred dollar raise every year <laughs> on the grounds, Armitage, you don't publish enough. I say, he's, uh, he's in the front and not on the plate. I don't know where he got it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I'm busy. It's a wonderful gadget, especially Somebody stole my laptop out of my car. I am now off computers, so I need a uh, phone like that. I don't even recognize the phone number. Where were we? Page, like, six, uh, page 51. 51. Yeah. Don't worry, we're getting there. We, we have a, just a few minutes left, I'm afraid. Yes, right. Well, so let me uh, zoom past uh, um, them. You, uh, you've heard me on uh, Mozart and Schubert. Um, on page 53, that's my musical trinity uh, in that poem. Um, uh, number 59 is a, a poem about the young woman I met when uh, uh, I and she were freshmen at Oxford. Uh, I was invited back to her parents' home in Yorkshire. She picked up uh, an impromptu of Schubert and played it, and I thought I'd been blasted into heaven. I had never heard such feeling and power put into. I went upstairs into the back bedroom where her parents had securely locked me. And um, I looked out across the fields towards Sheffield, a great industrial city. Red sky, all the furnaces were working. It was still the industrial revolution. Now that young woman, uh, I've written about her in my poem, in my poem about uh, Oxford. We were both uh, examined ultimately um, uh, by uh, Tolkien and Lewis and Dame Helen Gardner. Now, I used to visit uh, that young woman, the pianist, in her room, legally during afternoon hours only, um, in St. Hilda's College. And it so happened, uh, Helen, Dame Helen Gardner, excellent and ferocious scholar, um, had an office there. One day she opened the door, looked out and said, are you the young man who continues to visit Miss Smith? I allowed as how I was. I do wish you'd desist. She has a great future unless she's distracted. <laughs> now, I, of course, continued to distract her like that. What happens is she gets a graduate scholarship one day she comes out to the Bodleian Library and sees a woman, a, a, an unemployed woman with a passel of uh, underfed, unkempt kids and decides that having a pleasant time doing research in literature for your own advancement, I'm going to resign from academia and become a social worker. She did. In a cafeteria in, a Lond in London, a young Pakistani lawyer comes up to my would-be beloved, that's my would-be, not hers, um, and asks if he may sit with her. The next thing is, you know what comes next? She's emigrating 
to Pakistan and becoming an Islam and bearing him 10 children. And when she wasn't doing that, she was trying to raise the position of Islamic women. She's one of the foremost writers for uh, Islamic women, even in the supposedly liberated uh, um, modern Pakistan. And you know what good dealings we've had with them lately. Oh yeah, well the, the, these poems now are pretty well straightforward um, uh, because they mainly talk about my being in love and always getting it wrong and uh, uh, so on. Um, some of them are a bit bawdy, but uh, not as bawdy as you hoped they'd be. Um, and um, yes, um, the, the, the impact of the uh, architecture on Oxford, some of you in this room have told me, having been with me on my now extinct summer program in London and Oxford, I've talked about Oxford being a transformational experience for you, as it was for me. And by the way, the new principal head of the college, who is also the professor of biodiversity in Oxford University's Department of Biology, and is also on the um, International Committee on Climate, has just been raised to the House of Lords. She is now Baroness, but unattached to any political party, so that she can speak freely in the House of Lords about any scientific matter which is raised. And I have been upstairs in South Building saying to the present incumbent, why isn't she invited down here? She has said to me several times, these group of students you bring from Chapel Hill are wonderful. I'd like to meet uh, Chapel Hill. And I go up there and say, how about inviting this lady next time she's in the United States to come down? Armitage, I'm busy, bug off. Well, wait till he sees what I'm writing about him. <laughs> <laughs> Chancellor disgusting events. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be, to be published later. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not dependent on a salary from you <laughs> anymore. So anyway, well, quickly, what else have we got in here? We become modern. Um, I uh, images poems, which are sheer image, and you interpret the image in and of itself. There are several of those which I am uh, bombastic enough to um, draw your attention to. Um, uh, there, let's see, they're after the uh, Oxford poems. Um, Raindrops on leaves on page 71 is an example of this kind of uh, poem, which is simply the image itself, and you read into it without any poet elaborating on its significance, as people like Wordsworth used to do. Um, extinct among the stars, you couldn't have anything more popular to current than that one. So there's the, the real world. <clears throat> and the last one is a wonderful joke that I have to explain to you, page 74. Uh, the first, these are panels of honor, which are inscribed on the walls of St. Edmund Hall, and begin in 1240. The first name is Edmund, who became a saint, became Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, after founding teaching in an Oxford college, teaching the seven liberal arts to undergraduates, became Archbishop of Canterbury, was on his way to see the Pope when he died in the middle of France. So some of us periodically go on a pilgrimage to Pontigny, where he's buried, and you'll love this, this tiny little village. And we all, all we heretic Protestants, went to the service in this Catholic church. And the newspaper later reported, huge increase in the congregation last <laughs> Sunday. And it was all those heretics in there, just because it was uh, his place. Well, anyway, I've used up all my time. The prose, uh, let me tell you one story you can read about Tolkien and Lewis uh, in here. But one thing, when my college St. Edmund Hall was seeking to appoint a new tutor in Middle and Old English, right? 
and they wrote to um, <clears throat> Tolkien in Merton College and said to him, this Australian has applied for the job and we know he did his PhD after World War II under you. What, what can you say to recommend him? Tolkien wrote this reply, hire him. <laughs> That's all he said, sent a written reply. Hire him, unfortunately, the college had the good sense to do that. He was a wonderful guy, now deceased, RIP. Well, I said, I've run out of time, as I expected to do, and this lady is going to chase me off the platform. <laughs> I'll try I'm to worried do about that. you standing up there. Yes, right. Well, I'll sit but down. Do, for a bit. Yeah, sit down for a bit. Have a rest. Um, would you like? Would you like some water? I certainly would. All right, let me give you some. Well, this is an advanced it is an technical advanced. device. I'm going to put the list of um, yeah, please over there. Sign so, up, if you would uh, like to yeah. sign it for him, that would be wonderful. And um, like I said, my colleagues are are shutting up the shop um, shortly. But please, um, thank you so much for coming and for purchasing Professor Armitage's book from us and for everything else. And thank you for your excellent hospitality. And Anytime, respects. absolutely. Three cheers. For thank you, everyone. Quietly close.